Okay, welcome everybody to this virtual book launch hosted by the European Society of International Law. We're meeting today to discuss uh, a recent book. We're discussing it for about an hour. Um, and it's a book that really deserves our attention. It is this book. Um, the title you could see on the slide while we were waiting, it is about secondary rules of primary importance in international law. And it was published last year by Oxford University Press in the book series of the European Society of International Law. My name is Christian Tams, and I'm one of the general editors of this ESOL book series. And also, perhaps more pertinently, I'm one of your hosts for this hour book launch today. And it's a pleasure to be sharing this hosting role with my colleague Veronika Fickfack from UCL London and from the University of Copenhagen, who is also a general editor of the ESOL series. Now, we're delighted to have three colleagues with us to discuss the book, three colleagues who have been instrumental in making it such a thoughtful piece of scholarship. First, there's Katalin Sudchok. Katalin is assistant professor in international environmental law and climate law at Elte University in Budapest. And she has written one of the thought-provoking chapters in the book. And then we have Gabor Kaita and Marko Milanovic, two of the book's editors. Gabor is associate professor of international law, also at Elte Law School in Budapest. And Marko Milanovic is a professor of public international law at the University of Reading. Welcome to all of you. Now, Veronica and I will take turns in asking Katalin, Gabor, and Marco about the book, and we hope to bring out what is particular about it, what is perhaps behind the slightly mysterious title, and we hope to also bring out why we both felt that this was a book that is definitely worth your time. Before we kick off properly, let me make two further announcements. The first is about you, uh, the colleagues and friends in the audience, Friends of ESOL, a famous honorific title. Um, we'll do this largely in an interview format where Veronica and I will ask most of the questions and we hope uh, to be asking questions that you find pressing. Um, but we will reserve time at the end for questions and answers from the audience. And to make this work smoothly, we would ask you to use the chat function and write your questions into the chat you can trust Veronica and me that we will pick the most exciting and most relevant ones for, uh, to be read out and to be presented to our guests later today. But use the time while we ask questions to comment and to add points that you want to see addressed in the Q&A. Now, the second uh, comment is about the format of this event. We're hoping, of course, to pique your interest in a book that we find is worth anybody's interest. But we're also trying to showcase a book series, and that is the OUP ESOL book series in which this title is published. This is a series that has been running for a few years and that now features six books. Veronica and I feel that these are good books and that ESOL and OUP can be proud of their series. This is why we are today shining an ESOL spotlight on the most recent title. And this is why I hope we can make this a regular feature whenever a new book publishes in this series. So, but that's getting ahead of everybody. Let's start with the beginning. Let's start at the beginning, as they say, the stage having been set. Welcome again to all of you and over to you, Veronica, for our book launch chat. Super. Thanks so much, Christian. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. So I thought... Um, that we would really start with the title. And I'd like to sort of invite Gabor uh, and Marco to tell us a bit um, about what are secondary rules. Uh, so, so essentially, what is the book about? Um, Gabor, would you mind kicking us off? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Veronica. Can you, can you hear me? We can uh, hear you, yes. We are having some issues with the camera, but we can hear you very well. Exactly. Thank you very much for the question and for the introduction. So first of all, uh, let me uh, thank uh, uh, Masha Kali, our co-editor of this volume, who cannot be here uh, today, unfortunately. And I also would like to express my gratitude to Andre Nolkamper, who encouraged me uh, to pursue the idea of the conference, which proved to be the basis of this book. And uh, I'm also very grateful, and we are also very grateful to uh, ESOL book series uh, editors, Anna Fanaken and Carlos Exposito for their uh, 
uh, work uh, on this on this volume. Uh, so to answer your uh, uh, question, Veronica, uh, this uh, volume focuses on four domains of secondary rules uh, that fundamentally shape international adjudication, namely evidentiary rules, uh, standards of review, causation, and uh, and attribution. And uh, regarding secondary rules and uh, and the definition of secondary rules, uh, well, we are all aware that this uh, concept was introduced by Robert Ago, then ILC special reporter on state responsibility. And according to him and ILC, secondary rules are uh, rules uh, which have general applicability across uh, all areas of uh, international law. Uh, it is not entirely clear uh, as today uh, where Argo and uh, the ILC took the terminology, but uh, obviously uh, the most famous candidate is Hart and Hart's uh, concept of law uh, for, for, for this. Uh, actually, Hart's, uh, uh, for Hart, uh, primary rules are governed, uh, are governed conduct, uh, substantive rules and obligations, set of substantive rules and obligations, why secondary rules govern uh, uh, three uh, uh, sets of, uh, of rules in the legal system, uh, the criteria for validity of rules, uh, uh, the rules uh, uh, of change of, uh, of uh, uh, primary rules, and uh, rules on the mechanism of adjudication. Uh, what is actually interesting that uh, ILC secondary rules are none of these. Um, so the overlap between ILC's secondary rules and ART's secondary rules is, uh, is uh, uh, small, uh, but not insignificant. Uh, it is also clear that ILC secondary rules are not uh, uh, ARTIAN rules, not even the, the rules on uh, the mechanism of adjudication. Um, causation is, for example, a primary rule by the ILC and by ART. Uh, but attribution uh, is a secondary rule by the ILC and a primary rule by, by heart. Evidence and standards of review are secondary rules by heart. So as to our uh, own concept, the concept of the book, uh, secondary uh, rules uh, are neither, uh, we, don't, we didn't use ILC's uh, nor heart's concept, but there is uh, overlap with the ILC's and heart's concept. Our uh, concept on secondary rules is uh, also uh, functional uh, as the ILC's uh, approach. We try to capture rules that operate in the background of uh, international disputes. Um, and our concept is broad enough uh, to include rules of adjudication in the wider uh, sense, wider than arts uh, interpretation covering how international courts and tribunals apply international law to facts as well as the means and methods of establishing responsibility and fault through doctrines like attribution and uh, causation. Super, thank you so much. And Marco, to you, um, so the title of the book says, and you can see it behind me, um, talks about the fact that standard uh, secondary rules are of primary importance. Why primary importance? Well, because they often decide cases. They are often determinative of the outcome, especially, of course, in judicial contexts, but not necessarily even in judicial contexts. So now that I've answered your question, let me just say thank you. So thank you to you, Veronica. Thank you to Christian. Thank you to Esel. Thank you to Gabor, uh, though he remains unseen. And, and as he said, thanks, many thanks to our, our dear friend, Bashak Chali, who, who, who served with us as co-editor. So they are important. They're hugely important roles. Um, Take a case like, for example, Bosnian genocide before the ICJ, right? So Bosnia sues Serbia for, for committing genocide uh, in, the, in the Bosnian conflict. We have something like that going on now, right? Ukraine versus Russia. Much of that case is really determined by how the court framed all of these various secondary issues, how the court approached evidence, for example. It said, we want clear and convincing evidence that genocide happened, which depends on an inference of genocidal intent. Nothing less than that will suffice. The more serious the allegation, the court says, the greater the degree of certainty, the greater the degree of evidence we need. That largely determined the outcome that only 
in Srebrenica in July 1995 was genocide. The genocide actually happened and everything else was some other type of crime. Attribution. The issue was, you know, is Serbia responsible for that crime? And the court's ultimate answer is no. Serbia neither completely controlled or the, the Bosnian Serbs in such a way that they were de facto organs of Serbia, nor did Serbia control the specific act, the, 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 the Serbian genocide. And of course, now we can agree or disagree about whether this is a good approach, a good standard, but it's ultimately these secondary-ish, if you will, rules that determine the outcome of the case. And we, we, can, we can think of many, many, many similar cases in vastly different contexts from trade law, investment law, plain vanilla human rights to gen genocide and crimes against humanity, where rules like these really make a substantial difference. You know, we, often when you read a judgment and when you see how the court articulates the standard of review, at that moment, you know what the bottom line will be, right? So as somebody who has experience, you already know that this is gonna be the bottom line. Mm. Super. So then if I can ask you both as editors, um, so you've explained why the, you know, the topic is important, why the issues are that are raised are important, but why did the book have to be written? Like, are we, you know, has the scholarship been missing something or was it about collecting in, in the same place? This is after all an edited book. So what, 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 did it have to be written and why and and what does it add to the scholarship gabor do you want to have a first yeah, yeah. Uh, well yes i mean all, all of these you actually uh, you mentioned i mean just uh, jumping a bit back to what uh, what marco said uh, in a different way uh, in in hart's time uh, in the end of the 50s early 60s it might have been uh, right to say that international law is a primitive legal system with uh, having only primary uh, rules and no secondary rules in the Hartian sense, but we saw that there is some overlap between our definition and Hart's definition. Uh, today we have uh, dozens of international tribunals, we have thousands of uh, ongoing cases. Uh, international litigation is getting uh, more and more intense and resembles uh, domestic litigation. And uh, in, this, uh, in this setting, uh, we thought that it is even more important today than it has ever been before uh, to look at uh, secondary technical uh, rules. So rules in the background, look at their content, uh, whether scholars uh, really focused properly on the content of these rules, whether uh, uh, international adjudication, uh, arbitrators, judges, uh, really focus and give uh, the weight it deserves in their uh, in their uh, uh, analysis. Uh, we we really wanted to 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 ask questions about uh, uh, what the content, the real content uh, of certain secondary rules are, whether they are applied properly. Uh, whether they can really be applied interchangeably uh, between different fields as it happens uh, regularly. Uh, uh, and also we, we really wanted to, to measure and prove how much secondary rules uh, uh, really determine the outcome of, uh, of disputes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Marco, over to you. I saw you had a smile before when I asked. I had a smile because I was going to say, no, the book is completely unoriginal. Nobody should read it. But no, 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 the, the book does make a contribution. In, it, it does that in, in really, I mean, in bringing a lot of experts from different fields together, putting all of these rules that are not necessarily always thought of in terms of general applicability and having, you know, learning lessons from one particular subject area that may be very relevant for others, you know. So, you know, Christopher Lentz, for example, has a, a chapter on, non-appearance before international tribunals. So that is a very much a cross-cutting issue. And if you're now the European Court of Human Rights and you know Russia is not gonna appear in any cases before you, even though you retain residual jurisdiction over thousands of, of, of cases, you will have to learn from the experience of the International Court of Justice or from arbitral tribunals about what do you do when a party does not appear, right? Or if you're the International Court of Justice, 
you might really learn from a very rigorous approach to evidence, for example, of the kind recently employed in the attribution context by the European Court of Human Rights, in this case, case called Carter versus Russia on assassinating Alexander Litvinenko, or for, for instance, um, in the recent Netherlands and Ukraine uh, uh, versus Russia case that dealt with the relationship between Russia and pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine. So there's this, that, that, it is that cross-cutting sort of aspect of it that our book really wants to, to bring out. Yeah, and, and, and we should say that the book actually covers a lot of uh, different courts uh, and tribunals, and it really draws from that jurisprudence and from that practice uh, and looks at inconsistencies of application and what is cross-cutting. Absolutely. Uh, Christian, over to you, and we will now essentially zoom into different parts of the book. The book is made of four parts, so Christian is looking at standards of review. Thanks, Veronica. Thanks to uh, also to Gabor for summarizing already the four points. So the four the four parts: standards of review, causation, attribution, and evidence. And um, now, Catalin, uh, one of your chapter or your chapter is addressed to standards of review. Now we've heard already uh, from Gabor and Marco about why what secondary rules are instrumentally functionally defined, why they are emphatically of primary importance. Where do standards of review fit? what makes them secondary? What are they? And are they also uh, a concept that in Marco's terms decides cases? Thank you, Christian. So yeah, so first of all, some clarifications about the basic concepts perhaps. So uh, the standard of review is a procedure of mechanisms with which uh, international courts set the, the intensity and the depth of their review with which they would scrutinize states factual and legal allegations. Uh, so in this sense, it's a background rule that operates in uh, in every litigious uh, setting and process, um, mainly in the evidentiary phase, but also more deeply, perhaps, in, yeah, to, to engage with all the factual and legal narratives of, of the parties. So it's, a, in, in, it's an inevitable step in the legal analysis. The problem is that um, it's rarely defined on the level of primary norms. So uh, international courts... Um, developed as their own approach and their own concepts and doctrines uh, to set a particular standard. So um, it's, a, it's a degree concept. So it's a spectrum concept. The standard of review may uh, fall anywhere between two hypothetical uh, extreme ends, one being a total deference when the court automatically or quasi-automatically accept, accepts the, um, the um, submission of the parties and the, the arguments of the parties. And the other hypothetical extreme is conducting a very intrusive um, so-called de novo assessment when the court is ready to reassess the, the factual uh, claims and it's ready to, to substitute its own assessment for the, for the party's um, um, analysis. So basically state authorities analysis in a case. Um, so usually this, um, the standard of review is, um, is granted base, uh, based on two grounds. So uh, courts are usually deferential towards state positions, either because they believe that um, the primary decision maker, that is state authorities are better placed to make, make these decisions because they have superior epistemic capacity. This is called epistemic deference, or they believe that the primary decision maker uh, is better placed because they have the necessary democratic legitimacy uh, to, to decide about these very sensitive social, economic, or political issues, and this is called constitutional deference. Um, and we see that, you know, the, it's very the heart of the matter. So at the end of the day, the extent to which the court is, is willing to engage with the party's narratives uh, really defines uh, the, um, the, the, the essence of judicial task, to what extent they will uh, exert control over uh, the party's narratives. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it, um, it defines the, um, the latitude uh, with uh, which uh, states enjoy making claims. So there are strong arguments in favor of not to allow parties to make uh, their claims um, on their own, so they, they the court must discharge a judicial, judicial function. So setting overly deferential standards of review would arguably mean that the court just um, um, uh, abrogate its judicial function and would let one sovereign to to uh, make uh, to be the judge of its own cause, which is obviously um, illegitimate. So there are some legitimacy concerns about uh, choosing too deferential or too intrusive standards. So it's, it's a very uh, delicate 
balancing exercise, which the courts must do, um, and the parties um, usually uh, deem the actual standard to be a very contentious issue, uh, especially because it's not defined and they know that the court theoretically um, um, ha have a freedom to, to set any particular standard in their pleadings, they uh, deem it as a very contentious issue. Okay. Well, that, that gives us, I think, already from the way you've introduced it, uh, a sense of the breadth of the issues. I mean, from, from investment tribunals checking whether Argentina was right to call a state of emergency to presumably the ICJ assessing whether an arbitral award can stand, standards of review always matter. Now, your focus is not on all the issues, um, but on scientific and environmental disputes. Um, what makes the question, the very general question, a very general tool, I think, was your term. What makes it special in investment? Uh, sorry, in scientific and environmental disputes. Uh, well, I think because um, the uh, the selection of the actual standard is um, is an even more delicate uh, issue in a scientific dispute. So, in in, a, in another dispute which is not science based, so where scientific knowledge does not play any particular uh, role, uh, a court would face two main types of risks when it selects a certain uh, standard of review. Uh, if uh, if it opts for two deferential reasoning, then uh, it would uh, um, th those risks would arise that I've already mentioned, so that they would abrogate the judicial function, they would leave the parties' uh, allegations basically unchecked. But if they uh, were to choose a too uh, intrusive standard, then the parties would argue that uh, they, uh, the court encroaches upon sovereign prerogatives and it would be legit uh, illegitimate now, in a scientific dispute uh, where uh, scientific knowledge speaks very closely to the to the legal controversy, a third uh, type of legitimacy concern arise in my view, and this is called epistemic legitimacy or problems surrounding the epistemic legitimacy of the decision. Uh, so uh, this arises, uh, this problem arises when um, a court uh, wants to give uh, deference to a state based on epistemic grounds, so based on the uh, the allegation that the um, state authorities are better placed, they have the requisite expertise to to make complex scientific technical evaluations, whereas the international court itself lacks such training and lacks such expertise. Um, and uh, so I made uh, made this uh, perhaps. Uh, Quite both claim that, nevertheless, even uh, even these difficulties with with uh, with engaging uh, with scientific aspects for international court, I argue that uh, international courts ought not to be too deferential uh, towards the scientific claims of states because um, actually they should and they could uh, engage with the scientific narratives of the parties in a way that they can exert control. Uh, over uh, what scientific expertise will uh, be able to uh, get validated in a, in a, in a, in a litigious setting. So uh, they would not let parties to make whatever scientific allegations that they want. Uh, so, uh, and I argue that if we look at the actual case law of the ICJ or WTO dispute settlement mechanisms or the EU courts, we see that actually courts in, more recently, um, they, um, they are choosing such more intrusive standards. So they are focusing on the reasonableness uh, uh, of um, of science based claims like the icj did in the whaling dispute uh, the uh, the court was actually willing to to look at whether uh, the japanese whaling program uh, was reasonable and whether the the research project um, design and implementation could be deemed reasonable um, in 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 terms of its its own research goals uh, and if you look at the uh, case practice of WTO or the uh, EU courts, we see that uh, courts are now focusing their review on um, notions that such as consistency and coherence of the risk assessments, which are more intrusive reviews than just, let's say, con uh, conducting a, a good faith review or uh, completely deferring uh, epistemically to the assessments of experts and then only stipulating the requirement that those scientific positions uh, will be acceptable in an international litigation that meets certain scientific criteria, uh, the, the, the assessment of which would be completely outsourced to scientific experts. So my chapter deals with these, uh, these types of very uh, delicate uh, disputes where scientific knowledge inherently relevant for the court. International courts um, 
initially they tried to get rid of science, uh, very simply put. They tried to circumvent science in their assessments, but now we see at least, this is why my argument, that we see that courts are increasingly willing to um, engage uh, more with the scientific aspects of cases. And then they have to, again, meet um, a very, they have to strike a very fine balance. They ought not to set a too intrusive review because that would mean that they commit epistemic trespass. That would mean that they would decide the, the underlying scientific problem and scientific debate, which is not their function. Um, or, or they may set a too deferential review and then they would allow the, the parties essentially to mask whatever non-scientific motivation they may have with scientific uh, reasoning. And that would, again, be epistemically arbitrary because they would le uh, allow the parties to abuse the cognitive authority of science. And in this chapter, I argue that, that the, the, this, these um, frequently used standards of review, such as reasonable assessment, coherency assessment, and the assessment of reasonableness uh, are more intrusive reviews that are at the same time fit with the epistemic capabilities of international courts. So they are essentially legalistic reasoning. International courts are trained to decide about concepts such as reasonable <clears throat> coherency of reasoning. Uh, at the same time, they allow the courts to, um, when they actually put these intermediate standards uh, of review into practice, they prompt international courts to have a closer look at the scientific evidence. And in this sense, um, they strike, in my view, a good compromise uh, in the fact that they are intrusive and as, if, and as, as intrusive as they could be, uh, but they do not um, entice the court to commit epistemic trespass because, in fact, the court would not uh, have to decide about scientific dilemmas only, with, uh, only about legal dilemmas that are very closely rooted in, uh, in the science. Okay, well, that's a, that's a broad ranging response, which gives a hint at some of the broad issues covered in your chapter. I think the one big question that emerges is what is secondary about this rules? Is it a, not also always a question of sort of practice and self-perception of a court? But we'll come back to those towards the end. Over to you, Veronica, to zoom in, in some, on some of the other issues covered in the book. Super, thank you, Christian. Um, so uh, the part four uh, is part on attribution. Um, and both Marco and Gabor have a chapter in that part. And I'm going to start with Marco because he uh, essentially sets the scene for attribution in the ECHR case law. Marco, do you want to tell us about your argument um, and what the chapter clarifies? I, I, I will. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, maybe just a, a, a preliminary point of clarification. I mean, a lot of the discussion so far has been about international courts and tribunals. But actually, three of the four topics we deal with are not exclusive or specific to international courts and tribunals. So it's only standards of review that they're really limited to, to a judicial forum. Issues of attribution of causation of evidence, they are everywhere, right? They are in interstate reactions when, I don't know, the United States accuses China of committing a cyber attack against it. That's a question of attribution. There's also a question of evidence. What kind of evidence does the United States have for that? What kind of evidence should the United States put forward publicly? Yeah. So these are some of these issues are specific to courts. Some of them are not. Now, in my chapter, I do deal with a particular setting, which is the European human rights context, and I really explore a, not you know not necessarily as a, as a general matter how the European Court of Human Rights engages with the International Law Commissions and the ICJ's framework of state responsibility. But one with one specific topic, which is how there's a line of cases, and I really sort of quasi archeologically try to tr trace the origins of this line of cases, where they start using this particular language that a state can be responsible in some particular way if it acquiesces or connives in the conduct of some third party. And it's really remarkable when you, when you start reading these cases to see how this language actually starts from this litigation regarding Turkey and, and the Kurds um, and arguments of really good counsel in those cases, Francois Hampson, for example, how that language suddenly gets adopted by the court then it suddenly gets being used in many different ways. Yeah? 
Sometimes it's used by the court to describe why the state failed to comply with its positive duties, the duty of, of due diligence, essentially, to do all it could have done to prevent private actors or third parties from committing human rights violations. But then there's a really interesting line of cases where the court uses this language as a sort of complicity rule. So it's neither necessarily attributing the harmful conduct to the state, so engaging a negative obligation, nor is it saying the state is responsible for failing to exercise due diligence. It's finding something in between in terms of stigma and the nature of something responsibility and that's sort of a complicity type framework. And I see Vladislav Lanovo is with us who of course has written a very good book on complicity. And, and one thing that, that sort of my chapter teases out is essentially an ECHR specific theory of complicity. And I end with these sort of cases, the cases where this really pops out uh, uh, um, most obviously, which are these extraordinary rendition cases. Yeah, so you have the United States operating these black sites or otherwise harming individuals on the territory of European states, Macedonia, Lithuania, Poland, yeah. In one case, El Masri, where this guy gets really, a, you know, captured in Macedonia and then is, is rendered from Macedonia. The court finds Macedonia responsible for what the Americans did to the guy, as if it was Macedonia who did it, yeah? It's really using languages of, language of attribution. But in the subsequent cases that deal with CIA black sites in Poland and Lithuania, the framing is where very much one of complicity and the court really uses this language of acquiescence and connivance in the acts of the United States as the basis for this form of responsibility. And it's interesting because it's very peculiar, you know, it does not find a clear equivalent in necessarily the jurisprudence of other courts. Certainly it's not, you know, using article 16 of the ILC articles on state responsibility. It is crafting something bespoke but yet something that I think other institutions can learn from. So that's sort of what they do in the chapter. Fascinating. Thank you. And then Gabor, you finished the part by essentially trying to explain how these concepts are actually, when we look at different institutions, how they become fragmented and how there's inconsistencies and in how they're used. Would you like to tell us a bit about the chapter? Um. Yes, thank you, Veronica. Um, uh, I would say that the last four chapters, uh, the part on attribution, uh, uh, focuses uh, on well, not not just on, but but partly on on the definition of attribution and the scope of attribution. So what we what we understand on uh, attribution, and we also had a, a very nice uh, uh, debate with Marco on. On, on this definition, which was very, I think, very fruitful for uh, for both of us. Uh, so one of my uh, uh, my first argument, I, I have four main arguments to make in in this chapter. Uh, the the first argument is and regarding uh, the definition of attribution that attribution is not only used in state responsibility context. Uh, but also whenever uh, the connection between a state and an act needs to be established for the, for the purposes of international legal inquiry. Uh, so in my chapter, I looked at uh, attribution rules uh, in, in uh, USAR Bellum, in the field of USAR Bellum, uh, international humanitarian law and international investment law. Uh, but I could have also looked uh, to other fields uh, in, in international law, like uh, Christina Binder and uh, Stefan Wittig did in, uh, in one of the other chapters in this part. Uh, they uh, also looked uh, on the law of immunity and formation of uh, customer international law. So their approach was very similar to mine, uh, understanding uh, using a broader attribution uh, definition than, uh, than uh, the one which narrows it down only to state responsibility issues. Uh, my second argument is that uh, different fields uh, in international law use different attribution tests. And uh, although there is a certain overlap between these uh, uh, attribution tests, uh, caution must be exercised in uh, transferring specific attribution rules uh, from their original context to another field of international law. Uh, 
So for example, uh, uh, using uh, the effective control uh, test uh, based on Article 8 of uh, the rules of state responsibility in a uh, use ad bellum, use of force context, uh, uh, primary in uh, 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 undetect, uh, act of aggression context uh, is uh, uh, not impossible, but it's, it, it, it has to be uh, used with, uh, with, uh, with cautions. Uh, because it might lead uh, to a very different outcome than what we uh, actually uh, see if we use the, 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 the proper uh, attribution tests. So uh, my, my, my last and main argument is that uh, uh, the choice of an attribution test, as Marco already uh, pointed out in, uh, in the Bosnian genocide uh, case, for example, and also, as we know, in the Nicaragua case, uh, can decide the outcome of a legal dispute. Uh, whatever uh, the debate actually on the substantive primary rules is. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we've now looked at um, three chapters and two parts of the book, and I will now pass to Christian to zoom us out um, of these different parts and look at the book as a whole. We're all zoomed out after three years of uh, working with this technique. Look, I mean, before I ask my zoomed out questions, uh, I mean, my plea to the, the sort of the dozens of people uh, whose names appear on black tiles in the Zoom world, I mean, this is your chance to ask questions. You'll have noticed that we are covering a lot less than, or you will have sensed that we're covering a lot less than we planned because our colleagues on the chat are full of uh, information and full of sort of ideas about the book and occasionally are, respond at length. So don't worry, we can fill this hour on our own and we can fill probably two hours or three hours on our own talking about the book. But this is your chance to uh, put us on the right track and tell us what we should have really asked. So, but you need to do this in the chat. Okay, that's the interlude. Zooming out then. Um, I think this is probably to all, but I'll itemize it because otherwise you'll sort of, uh, you'll sort of all say the same thing. Um, look, I think I'm, I'm interested still in this notion of secondary rules. And I think Gabor said a while ago, at the beginning that this was a functional notion that was emphatically not hard, emphatically not the ILC. And I think that's useful. I think we need to reflect on this more. Uh, Marco said they were of primary importance. And I think we've got a sense for the, the relevance of these rules. And I think also for why they matter. I mean, that's been pretty clear from what uh, all three of you have said. What I'm puzzled about is, are there really any rules? Because so far we're getting a picture of diversity. So Marco says what the ECHR does is ECHR specific. Catalin says there's three different approaches between three different courts. Are there any rules that are secondary or is it really just sort of issues facing different institutions uh, and they all somehow muddle through? Maybe I'll start with Marco on this, uh, but then I want to hear also from Catalin about how it plays out in her field. Well, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Christian. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily such a binary stark choice, you know between either it being simply an, an issue of general interest and or, or or there having to be specific rules of general applicability. It's both of these. So these are questions that certainly all international courts are interested in. They may have specific, you know, context specific answers to these questions. Often, however, they just do whatever the general framework tells them to do. Um, so it's not like the European Court of Human Rights will just always go its own way. Yeah, no. You know, often it'll actually rely on the superstructure of international law in which it is embedded and say, okay, this, these are the rules we need to apply. So, I mean, let me give you a specific example. In Carter versus Russia, the court, a chamber of the court, directly applies Article 8 of the LC Articles of State Responsibility and says, Russia effectively controlled the individuals who assassinated Alexander Litvinenko in London. Yeah, and the court goes through the evidence it has for that. Interestingly, for various other courts, it draws adverse inferences from the fact that Russia failed to answer questions or failed to cooperate with the court to the extent the court thought appropriate, right? But the general framework is being applied. Now, the key message that we want to send in the book is that it's fine to have subject specific answers to some questions, yeah? It, this is not some kind of anti-fragmentation screed, right? No, no, 
it's okay to fragment so long as you justify yourself. So long as you explain what you're doing and why, and so long as you think about it. I mean, to give you a very specific example, again, the recent Netherlands and Ukraine versus Russia decision of the European court, where the court dealt with this relationship between Russia and the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And instead of, at least to some extent, applying the ILC rules of attribution, Article 4, Article 8, in light of how the ICJ interpreted it then, you know, the court just said, well, everything these people did is attributable to Russia. Yeah, just like that. And I don't have a problem with that specifically. I have a problem with the court not justifying why it thought this was necessary, why it thought this was the right thing to do. So I think that's our key message, which is that certainly in the institutional context, courts need to think about these issues properly. They need to articulate their approaches. They need to justify departing from some kind of general framework. Okay, that's great. Now, let me, I mean, I think that's great. And I think, uh, I, I think that the message comes across very clearly that this is not sort of a, a plea for sort of one size fits all approaches to your four themes. Still, I think, let me just sort of perhaps insist once for sort of a question that's more uh, directed to Catalin's field, uh, because it seems to me that, I mean, in, in state responsibility, which is presumably for most of us on the call, the area where we've most carefully, if we have thought at all, thought about secondary rules, I think it took a while for there to be talk about the secondary theory. I mean, you needed sort of groundwork, and then all of a sudden people realize, okay, maybe we have secondary rules. So I think Yassine in the sort of 1963 debate says, it's a question of spelling out the elements of a general theory, and the elements are already there. We just now need to articulate them. And I'm wondering whether for your four fields, we can make the same assessment. The elements are there, we just now need to articulate them. And of course they leave, Marco, I think your point is absolutely well taken. They leave room for, for diversity and specialized uh, functional specialization. But Catalina, in your field, I mean, do you think there is a general notion of standard of review that then is varied according to subject matter in the way that Marco has just outlined it for attribution? Well, I guess uh, at some level, I think uh, my answer is yes. I think uh, international courts are faced with very similar dilemmas, uh, which I think broadly we can describe this dilemma as which how far should we go into um, having a look at the party's narrative. So this is what I call a standard of review. Sometimes it's called deference, sometimes it's called scrutiny. Uh, so it, it has many names and it, it can be articulated through different textual variations, but the but the dilemma, the core dilemma is, is, is the same. Whether, yeah, to, to, what, to what extent international court believes that they are well-placed to make a certain determination, which was done in the first place by a primary uh, decision maker at, at, a, at the level of the state. Uh, so I think um, this this um, this dilemma is cross-cutting. So um, and then we see that the answers given to this dilemma, uh, yeah, are quite inconsistent and quite diverse, and there may be a bit of a chaos. Uh, but I think that um, this gives yeah ample room for further research. I think now we we have these um, building blocks uh, about. Um, yeah, we, we now we know what we call the grounds of deference. We know what what are the types of deference, what are the context of deference. But now we, there's time now to look at the the whys and whens and hows. So why do we think that a certain type of deference is legitimate in a certain field uh, under cert certain substantive laws by a certain uh, type of judicial fora? Uh, uh, what are the intermediate ground uh, intermediate um, forms of standards of review? Uh, how uh, these affect uh, the the reasoning of the court. So I think uh, that there are many many questions that still need to be answered, and uh, and this is more about the 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 context the the functioning yeah the the dynamic functioning of of deference and standard of review in the practice of international courts. I think uh, much has been written about standard of review so far, and they I think. Um, did a good work in terms of clarifying the basic concepts, but now we should uh, look at the finer anatomy of, of deference and, and, and really see what are the more systemic implications, what are the normative implications, whether do uh, whether we think that a certain standard is justified in a certain type uh, of uh, field or disputes. Yeah. Okay. 
That's great. And I think it's also a wonderful segue towards the final question that I wanted to ask Gabor, namely, what are the next steps? I mean, you've, we've spoken now about if you want takeaways from your edited work. And I think there, there are many more, of course, that we could explore. But if we're looking, I mean, Gabor, you spoke at the beginning about the motivations and the start of this project. Where does this research go? What would, I mean, if you were to set up sort of a, a, a second secondary rules book, uh, what would you cover that has not been covered? Where should the next, uh, where should people who are listening in, perhaps prompting, uh, sort of reflecting on whether they should edit a book, where should they go? What should be the, what are the next frontiers of research in this field? Uh, great question, uh, Christian, thank you. Uh, I think there are many, many directions where uh, the next book could go on, actually. Uh, we didn't look at all fields. Uh, all jurisdictions, uh, domestic courts. So the same, the same secondary rules could be looked at uh, at different flora, uh, different fields of international law. Uh, other secondary rules uh, could be examined or discovered or uh, or uh, analyzed uh, in in such a such a book, for example. Uh, one of my one of my uh, uh, points was that uh, that the interrelation between attribution rules in different fields uh, varies and they are not interchangeable, but they are, affect each other. These effects, uh, the, the effects uh, between the secondary rules and also between primary and secondary rules, I mean, the variation and effects is, uh, is, uh, uh, is numberless. So we can look at hundreds, thousands or unlimited variations of uh, of impacts between secondary rules and primary and secondary rules and uh, at the end of the day i think that that the job is not done i mean we, we started the job to raise awareness on uh, on the on the issue that secondary rules are of primary importance but uh, i think this is just the, the beginning secondary rules are probably even more uh, important or if we take it seriously that primary secondary rules are of primary importance then we really have to deal as much at least with these rules than with second with, with primary rules so there is a lot of room for research in the future i think that's great thanks uh thanks gabor <laughs> so also an empowerment message for all of those listening in wondering where their next book could be veronica Super, thank you so much, Christian. Um, so thank you everyone again uh, for uh, all of your thoughts uh, and for answering our questions, but we will now open up to a few questions we have had, we have received in the chat. And I'll start uh, really by uh, Pierre Darjon's first question, uh, which is to what extent do secondary rules actually entail obligations? Um, so he he's asking, are these rules really obligations for the adjudicator? Do they limit the adjudicator's powers? So I wonder if any one of three of you would like to take that one head on. I mean, I think the some of them are specifically about the duties of the adjudicator. Um, rules of evidence can also be of that kind. Um, I think Pierre was also thinking about whether outside the courtroom, we can speak of secondary rules, you know, putting forward obligations. I, I, I would say, you know, these are not, the rules that we were looking at are not rules of conduct as such. You know, don't do X or do X, but actually causation and attribution are very much part and parcel of these obligations of these rules of conduct, you know, when there's a rule that says do not emit carbon or you need to do your best to stop some kind of environmental harm, that those rules contain implicit or explicit points of causation and attribution. So they are about obligations too. They're not just about, you know, what, what a court may do. Catalin, mm -hmm. you wanted to come in? Yeah, thanks. I would just add that I think an overarching obligation for international court in terms of proper applications of the secondary rules is that they need to be open about uh, the, the actual standards and secondary rules that they are applying in their reasoning and they need to justify um, uh, their uh, the, way, um, the, the actual 
choice of their standards of review. So we conclude in this book that, for instance, in my narrow field of research in terms of um, deference, that the variety of standards, the inconsistent applications of standards may not in itself be a problem. The problem is that if, when, if and when these are not justified and openly discussed um, in the reasoning. Mm -hmm. And I think Gabor, do you want to add something? Yeah, just very quickly. And also these secondary rules limit courts in their uh, in their adjudication. Mm -hmm. I mean, if uh, if it is true that, for example, there are different attribution standards in different fields, and these standards are not interchangeable, then it might it might it might be very convenient to 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 use a different attribution test because it influences uh, the outcome. But you cannot you cannot uh, use a different attribution test if it is if it is context specific. And I argue and. Uh, and Christina Binder and, uh, and Stefan Wittich argue in the same way that there are certain attribution uh, standards which are not interchangeable, which are context specific. You cannot just uh, cherry pick uh, attribution tests and then for your convenience, apply them in your judicial analysis without any limits. Okay, thank you for that. So I wonder, um, and, and I'm really building here on Anna's uh, and Vladislav's uh, questions, I wonder to what extent we can, g g given the inconsistent of, uh, of, uh, application of these rules by different courts, to what extent I think we can call them rules. I think that was one of the questions that also builds on Christian's previous um, sort of points. And then, then the second then point from that is, if you wanted to push them into being rules, it is one of the arguments you're making or arguing for greater consistency across the board in terms of how they're applied. I don't know who you'd, who'd like to take that. Marco, should we start with you? I, I suppose, you know, are they really rules presupposes we have a common definition of what we mean by a rule? If by that you mean it leaves no discretion at all to the decision maker, well, I mean, then none of this stuff that we do for a living is a rule, yeah? It, there's always room for some level of discretion of the decision maker, but they are rules. Like when the ICJ says, you need to give us clear and convincing evidence. I mean, that is a rule. When the, um, you know, when the European Court of Human Rights says, you need to prove to us that a state controlled this assassin, that is a rule. I mean, it is a rule they could depart from if they want to, you know, in some context, some cases, if they provide good justification, but that is no different from anything else, you know. So yes, they are rules. They're rules. Okay. <laughs> Catalin and Gabor, did you want to say anything about the consistency and, and, and whether or not it's desirable to push for more? Yeah, I, would, I think I would I would agree with Vlad's with um, question or comment. I think he, he's also in favor of consistency, judging by his excellent chapter, that because he's also one of the chapter authors of this book. So yeah, I, I would definitely agree that in order to not to appear arbitrary, uh, the parties would expect international courts to decide similar, factually and legally similar cases in a similar way. Uh, so um, yeah, in terms of the narrower field of standard of review, definitely greater consistency would be called for uh, incomparable situations, but like, uh, you know, the devil is in the details. So it's very hard to uh, analyze um, judicial dilemmas from the viewpoint of deference because seemingly different, seemingly similar cases may be different because in one uh, occasion, uh, international court defer to states on basis of uh, constitutional grounds, whereas in the other case, um, the court would defer to states on epistemic grounds. And then these two grounds of deference are, are similar, so uh, are different. So um, just because a court refers to, let's say, public health reasons, um, you would not know whether it defers uh, to the decision maker on epistemic or constitutional grounds, uh, because public health policy uh, may uh, involve both considerations. So it is uh, um, it is possible that we think that two, yeah, it's arguably two seemingly similar decisions uh, may be uh, different if we look at the very details of a differential reasoning and. At the end of the day, we, we may find legally relevant differences between two uh, situations. So I would just caution um, about, um, yeah, I would just add, just flag this issue that, uh, yeah, we need greater we need greater consistency, but sometimes um, 
uh, the differential reasoning is so complex that, that we can make the argument that essentially similar situations are different. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gabor, I don't know if you've got any final words. Uh, not to this question. I fully agree with Marco and, uh, and Kathleen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you everyone really for answering our questions and giving us a taste of the book. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for being with us uh, to celebrate really the, the book launch of secondary rules of primary importance. Um, I think for us, uh, for Christian and I, uh, and for Esau, this was really an opportunity to thank uh, the editors of the volume, so Gabor, Bashak, Marco, the contributors of the volume, um, many of whom are on this call, but also uh, editorial board members who have worked uh, and, and participated in a number of volumes that we have um, published as part of the uh, part of the series. So that's Bashak Chali, Carlos Esposito, Andre Nolkemper, Yuval Shani, uh, Christian, uh, and Anna van Aken. Um, we would invite everyone to take advantage of the, um, sorry, I need to point the other way, of the uh, discount uh, for the book. Uh, you can get a 30% discount from o OUP with that uh, special code uh, to buy the book. And I guess I'd like to finish um, just with this thought that the editors also do in their first chapter. Um, they say that, um, you know, secondary rules uh, are um, still something that we're debating, but we must take them seriously from a methodological system consistency and legitimacy points of view. Um, so uh, looking forward to more discussions on this topic. Uh, and thank you everyone very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Here's the discount code. <laughs>